chemical properties of soils. All right, so let's get right into it. Okay, so our objectives are, one, list and describe the factors that affect soil chemistry. Two, carry out a soil test. Three, define the term soil pH, buffering capacity, and cation exchange capacity. All right, so when we're talking about the chemical properties of soil, we are basically talking about the interactions between these five main factors of chemical properties as it relates to soil. So the first one that we have here is mineral content. The second one, organic matter. The third, soil pH, then buffering capacity, and then finally, cation exchange capacity. All right, so let's dive into mineral content first. When we talk about mineral content, we basically refer into what are the minerals that are inherently available in our specific soil type. Now, soil type depends on the parent rock material. So if you remember your soil profile, you would remember that each soil has parent rock material and based on that parent rock material, it will inherently influence what type of minerals are available in your particular soil. So, the mineral content of a soil is determined by its parent rock material, percentage of organic matter, and the quantity of clay in your given soil sample. So, what are some of these nutrients that we are talking about? These nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, zinc, boron, etc. All right? Now, limestone rock inherently would have a lot of calcium because limestone consists of calcium carbonate primarily. However, in St. Vincent, we are fortunate enough to have volcanic type soils, which basically would have nutrients such as phosphorus, potassium, some calcium, some phosphorus as well. So basically we are at an advantage where we have more of these nutrients available. And you would see that the more nutrients that you have, the better it is for plant growth and development. In addition, clay and organic matter increases the soil's ability to hold nutrients, which is essential for plant growth and development. So if you remember your physical properties of soil, you would know that textural classes include things like your silt, sand, and clay particles. So we are saying here, if your soil has a lot of clay particles, not too much, but if it has enough, that's a good thing. And if it has organic matter, that's also a good thing, meaning that your soil will have the nutrients that is available for plant growth and development. All right, so let's jump into our organic matter. Now, when you hear the word organic matter, what do you think comes to mind? Organics, when you hear the word organic, something natural, you know, should come to mind. So, soil organic matter consists of living things such as your soil microbes and decaying remains of plants and animals. It is important to note that the term humus is used to describe dead organic matter which have decomposed considerably. So let me pause here for a while to differentiate between the two. So organic matter, you will have both living and dead. So organic matter, your living microbes that are in the soil doing their work, and also your plant materials and your animal remains that have died. Now, humus, on the other hand, describes how well these dead plants and animals would have decomposed over time. And for those of you who have used um, pen manual before, you know that it is important for you to make sure that it is well decomposed before you apply it to your soil because of the factor that it can burn your plant if it is not well decomposed. And that's basically how it works. So humus, which we often describe as that dark 
layer that is on the top surface of the soil is only um, present after the decomposition has gone considerably a long way, all right? Now, humus plays an important role in the quality of the soil that you have. Now, do you know of any importance that humus plays? You know of any? All right, so let me share a few with you. Now, humus, for one, because it's a derivative of your organic matter, will add nutrients to the soil, first and foremost. So that's probably one of the most important um, aspects of adding humus to your soil. Secondly, humus improves the structure of the soil. So if your soil, say for example, is very sandy, and you are to add humus to your soil, it will help to improve the ability for that soil to hold water, to hold nutrients, and that in itself is an environment that is good for soil plant growth and development. Also, if you have clay, and the clay is a bit too thick for that plant root to grow and develop, adding humus to that soil also improves the soil aeration ability. So now your soil can breathe better so, the, so that your roots can also grow and spread and respire as they should. So humus is very important here. Now, another aspect of humus that is very important to us here as we speak about the chemical properties of soil is the buffering capacity. Now, what is buffering capacity? This is the ability of the soil to resist changes or fluctuations in the pH value of that particular soil. So, when we get into pH, I'll explain a little bit more what pH is, but just think about it this way. If your soil pH does not fluctuate a lot, then your crop productivity is predictable and you really want your soil to remain where the ideal pH is so that your crop production can be ideal. The buffering capacity helps the soil to resist changes to soil pH fluctuations so that it remains where it should be. All right, now our ideal soil in our diagram, our pie chart there has 25% air, 25% water, 45% mineral, and 5% organic matter. So any soil in its ideal state should at least meet these requirements, all right? Right, so let's talk about our soil pH. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, soil pH is a measure of how acidic or how alkaline the soil is, all right? And you're gonna realize that to go with our acidic and alkaline values, there's a nice pH scale displayed on our screen. So I'm gonna explain how you interpret your pH scale and how it is relevant to crop production. All right, so our pH scale ranges from zero to 14, all right? And in the middle, we have seven. And seven here represents a neutral point where it is neither acidic nor is it alkaline. Now, from zero to 6.9, you have the acidic side of the scale. And then from 7.1 to 14, you have our alkaline side of the scale, all right? Now, listen up carefully because this might sound a little confusing. As the numbers go towards zero, you have a stronger acid being formed. And as the number goes towards 14, closer to 14, you have stronger alkalines being formed. So, if I am to give you a range, I would say from zero to three, you have strong acids. And as you move closer to seven, so four, five, and six, you have weaker acids. The same for alkaline. So let's say from eight to 10, the alkaline would be weak. And going up to 11, 12, 13, and 14, you have stronger alkalines. Now, 
the terminology goes, as the pH is low, it is referring to acidic pHs. And if the pH is high, we say that it is alkaline. So those are some things to remember. Now, as it says, numbers ranging from zero to six indicate soils that are acidic, while numbers from eight to 14 indicate soils that are alkaline. Now, how do we know if the soil is acidic or not? Now, you first have to carry out a soil test. But before we get there, let me talk a little, about, a little bit about nutrient availability and soil pH ranges. So if it hasn't crossed your mind as yet, a question you should be asking, well, what is the ideal pH range for crops to grow and develop? So we know about our scale, we know what the numbers represent, now we are going to talk about which of these numbers or which range of these numbers is an ideal range for crop growth and development. So, the ideal range is anywhere from 6.5 to 7. So if we could go back to that screen that has our chart, wonderful. So, anytime you're in that range, 6 to 7, you're in that ideal pH range. And 6.5, if you want to pin it down to a specific number, right, is what we would describe as the ideal pH range. And the reason for that is very simple. Now, nutrients can be in the soil, but not available for plants to um, uptake those nutrients. So what the pH, ideal pH does is make those nutrients available for root uptake from plants. So if you look at our scale here, you can see at 6.5, it overlaps where most nutrients are available for plant growth and development. And that's why you want your buffering capacity to resist any changes in your pH so that you're able to maintain that ideal pH range. And how do we um, influence the buffering capacity? By the clay content, and the organic matter that is available in your soil. So the ideal pH, 6.5, you don't want it to fluctuate, so you add your organic matter and your clay, especially if you have sandy type soils. And in addition to that, you want to make sure that all these nutrients are available for plant growth and development, so you're aiming for a 6.5 pH range. Now, how do we know if our soil is at 6.5? Is there anything that we can do? So at this point in the lesson, I'm going to go through what is called a soil pH test. All right? And our soil pH test can be done in your schools, at your labs. Now, for those of you who do agricultural science, you would know that when you get to Form 4 and Form 5, this can be one of the skills that is required of you by CSEC. So let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the soil pH test before we actually get into it. So there are a few things that you would need. And in our picture described here on the screen, there's a fancy device here that allows us to just place a probe in our soil solution here and allows us to measure that soil pH on a digital meter. However, today we don't have a digital meter, but that doesn't mean that we cannot carry out the tests and get good results. So, let's walk you through the steps. All right. So first thing first, I have here with me a beaker with distilled water in it. And it is important to have distilled water because you don't want it to influence the range of your pH or the results of your pH when you test your soil. Then you have your sample of soil that should be dried, all right? So you, let's say you go to visit a farmer's field, you take a sample of his soil and you bring it back to the lab to be tested. So this is just a sample displayed here as well that was in the beaker. All right, so we also have here set up previously to recording we have our filter paper, our funnel, 
and we have something going on here which I will explain a bit later when we get to that stage. So, so the first thing that you should do is you take your, your water that is distilled and you add that water to your soil sample that you would have collected. All right, here's your glass rod and you just simply mix it to form a solution. All right, so you mix it properly. You know, take your time, do your mixing, ensure that you get it to a solution consistency as best as you can. All right, now, as you can see here, it is very murky. There's no way you can do a pH test with murky water. So that takes us to the next important step that you must do. All right, so here we have our filter paper, right? And our filter paper is going to filter out all the sediments and create a clear filtrate that is displayed here. Now, how do you fold your filter paper? All right, so think of it as folding it in half at first. All right, so you get two halves, all right? And then you take that half and you fold it once more into equal sides, all right? Now, for those of you who think of food when you see a shape like this, this resembles a slice of a pizza, right? So if, there's, if that will help you to remember, just at the end of the day, you should have something looking like this. So let's just backtrack your whole paper, fold it in half, all right? Then you fold it in half once more and you end up with your slice of pizza, <laughs> all right? So the next thing that you do, you open one side. If you could get this on the camera really good, all right? So here you have your filter paper and you open one side. Now you don't want to open it in the middle. You want to find one side, right? And you're going to add this to your funnel. Now, for demonstration purposes, we have already did that section of the experiment. So what I'm going to do now, you're going to pour some of your sample into the funnel that has your filter paper. And if the camera could zoom in really good here, you should see the filtrate coming through the filter paper as a clear substance. And that is what we are going to test. All right, now, to carry out our test, we have with us here our indicator paper. So this is what is called pH indicator paper. And this is, different, this is different from litmus paper, just so you know, all right? Now, your pH indicator paper has graduations on it with specific colors to indicate which pH value belongs to which color that you see. So we have pH ranging from one to six on this side, and pH values ranging from seven to 11 on this side, all right? So what is going to happen is, you're going to take a piece of your indicator paper, all right? And then you're going to test your filtrate to determine what your pH value is. So let's do that now. All right, so make sure your hands are dried, okay? So you don't affect the results, okay? So now I'm just going to add our pH indicator paper into our filtrate that we poured into the Petri dish. And here you can see the color. All right. 
And now what we're going to do, we're going to measure it or compare it to what the pH scale has as its values on your indicator paper. So, based on my observation, I don't know if you could get that on camera there, right? Based on my observation, right, this seems to be right in the pH range where we have pH 6, which is slightly acidic and it's very close to what our ideal pH range should be. Now, does anybody remember what we said the ideal pH range should be? If you don't remember, it is 6 to 7. So, based on our soil sample here, we are right in that range where the pH is ideal. And remember, having an ideal pH, the benefit is nutrients will be available so that the plants can take up those nutrients and benefit from all the nutrients that are available so it can grow and develop as it should. All right. So that's a simple experiment. I hope you guys um, would have captured the essence of, of doing so. All right. So let's talk about cation exchange capacity. Now, it might seem as though it's a term that is um, complicated, but I'm going to take my time and do the best that I can to explain what it is all about and how can we use that information to better our understanding of crop growth and development. Now, if you just look at soil outside as an average person, it doesn't seem as though much is going on. But to a person who is trained, you will know that ideally, it is not just an arbitrary thing that is outside. Soil is actually alive, and there are a lot of things that, that goes on in our soil. So one of these things, as it relates to the chemical aspect of soil, is the cation exchange capacity. Cation exchange capacity is a measure of how many cations can be retained on the soil surface of a, part, of a soil particle. Negative charges on the surface of the soil bind to positively charged molecules and not only that, it allows for these molecules to exchange. Now, so let me slow down and explain that. So first things first, what are cations? Now, you should have known from your previous year in Form 2 that you have things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and those are some of your nutrients that you should be aware of by now. Now these nutrients, some of them carry a positive charge, and that positive charge is what categorizes them or makes them um, cations. So for example, calcium and magnesium are some of the well-known cations, and potassium as well. So anytime you see um, symbols being written for those nutrients and you see a plus sign to it, then those nutrients can also be understood as cations. And cations are your positively charged um, nutrients that are inherently in your soil. Now, your soil should have some degree of um, clay available. And because of the clay and the organic matter, it is going to increase those negative charges or those negative soil particles that are going to attract your cations. So, your cations are positively charged. Your soil particles, especially the clay and organic matter, those are negatively charged. Now, I used to play with magnets when I was small. And I know that sometimes the magnets will attack to each other and if you flip them around, they repel. This is what we are trying to explain here. When you have two opposite charges, they attract to each other. So your negative charge on the soil particle and your positive charge on your cations, they are going to be attracted to each other. So that is why when we mentioned earlier, clay and organic matter plays an important role in having those nutrients available in your soil. If you don't have clay and organic matter available, these nutrients don't have anything to lock onto. Therefore, they can be leached 
and be not available for your plants to take them up. So the cations are your positively charged ions in the soil. Now, you also have your negatively charged ions. So, the negatively charged ions, obviously, those are the ones that will have your negative sign attached to it. That's how you identify the difference in between. So in our diagram here, we have an example of a root system, and we also have a clay particle that is drawn there. And on, those clay pa on that clay particle, you can see those negative charges, and also attached to it are your cations. So, can you identify any of the cations that you see? Remember, the cations are the ones that are positively charged. On your clay particle there, you should see K+, which represents potassium. You should see Ca2+, which represents calcium. And at the top there, you should see Mg2+, if you just shift a little over to the clay particle itself. Right, so nice. So there's our clay particle. We have our K2, K+, we have our Ca2+, and we have our Mg2+. And those represent our cations. And remember we said that our cations are those positively charged ions that will be attracted to the negatively charged um, particle in the soil. Now, what happens here? The roots themselves, they have some of the cations attached to it. And if you follow the concept, you will realize that the roots also have some negative charge attached to it as well. So how does these nutrients move from our clay particles to the roots? The major one here is by diffusion. So by now you should know that diffusion speaks about molecules moving from a region of high concentration to regions of low concentration. So surrounding our clay particle, you will have regions of high concentrations of your nutrients. And in your roots, you will have regions of low concentration. So what is happening there, by diffusion, the process of diffusion, nutrients will move from your region of high concentration to your regions of low concentration, and then they're absorbed into the plant. So drawing back on your form to um, knowledge, we know that the xylem vessels are the ones that are responsible for the uptake of water from the soil and travels all the way to the other plant, parts of the plant, like your leaves, your stems, etc. So, a clay particle which is negatively charged binds the cations. The cations are exchanged for hydrogen ions and those are the ones that are H+. All right? And then, basically what you're going to have there is that interaction between your negatively charged and your positively charged. This basically wraps up our lesson for today. So I'm going to ask a few questions just to see if you remember anything that we um, discussed. And these questions are going to be basically surrounding what our learning objectives should have been, which I highlighted earlier in the lesson. Question one, can you define what is the ideal pH value or the ideal pH range? If so, you have been listening. Thank you for listening. For those of you who forgot, the ideal pH range is between 6 and 7. And if you pin it down to a number, you will have 6.5. What about buffering capacity? Can you define what buffering capacity is? Buffering capacity simply refers to the ability of the soil to resist changes in pH values. And you want that to happen so that your ideal pH range can remain stable. And the final question is, what are some of the positive cations that are available in our soils? So we just covered that topic, that part of the topic. Do you remember any? So we have a few, calcium, magnesium, and potassium, All right? Just to name a few. And remember, you can identify them by the positive sign that is attached.
to these um, symbols. Okay, so thank you for joining us today on 